Hi, everyone. My name is Clara Awe, and I'm the director of the Urban Pharmacy Program at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Pharmacy. The Urban Pharmacy Program is one of UIC-COP's concentration program. The Urban Pharmacy takes advantage of a location in Chicago in order to address the challenges of healthcare disparities in medically underserved communities. Students enrolled in the UFAM program are engaged longitudinally with faculty members within various Chicago neighborhoods. At the end of the spring of their fourth year and to fulfill the requirement to earn their concentrations, students are required to complete and present their capstone projects. Here are the 2020 UFAM student capstone presentations. Thank you. Okay, hello, um, my name is Michelle Cho and I'm a fourth year pharmacy student here at University of Illinois at Chicago College of Pharmacy. And um, for me personally, I chose to do um, the urban uh, pharmacy program because I wanted to uh, learn more of just kind of different um, disparities within um, this urban setting and really see where I can kind of fill in the areas to make an impact within the community. Um, so I thought this would have been a really good um, professional development um, just process for me. And so today I'll be presenting my project on the impact of drug safety, education, and adolescence. All right, so this is just my capstone presentation outline. So first I'll be um, kind of just going through the different problems of drug safety in adolescents. Um, and then I'll talk about the demographics and health disparities uh, for the target population that I had for my study. Um, I'll also go over the project description um, and then the partnership that I was able to uh, find with City Year and then the methods and results of my project. And then also I'll just conclude it and add some remarks um, with future implementations. So overall, this is just kind of a general UFARM program timeline. So for the first year of pharmacy school, um, for me, it was just really learning about the different health and social disparities. Um, and I think this first year was really fundamental in um, me to have a basis of, you know, what's going on within the Chicago area. Because uh, for me personally, I'm from out of state. So just to really learn about it um, within this first year um, helped me kind of set up uh, my project. And so, um, you know, it really kind of helped me to develop ideas. And the second year was to really create that curriculum um, because my project is more on a curriculum base and um, just to find that partnership using my buy-in. Um, and then the third year pharmacy school is when I conducted my project and I collected data. And then my last year was to really just analyze the result and finalize it and um, put it all together uh, for my capstone project. Um, so this is my buy-in. Um, so these are just some of the key pieces of information that I used as um, my buy-in to help find partnerships. So I was able to share um, how the misuse and abuse of drugs have been impacting the youth population, especially in middle school and high school who are facing peer pressure in social settings and have a lack of knowledge about um, just the dangers of drug misuse. So observational studies actually indicate that early drug use has been shown um, to be a strong predictor of future, uh, future drug abuse and um, about two in 10 among 12th graders use prescription medication without an actual prescription. So providing knowledge about commonly abused drugs and how to identify the signs and symptoms of prescription and over-the-counter misuse and abuse can really help negate the issues and drug problems that many teens face every year. Um, and so here, um, there are many reasons why teens choose to do drugs as listed here. Um, so you can see, you know, they might just do it because they're feeling bored or they want to feel cool. A big part of it is peer pressure. Um, even friends and family that have maybe ask, um, access to medication. Um, and maybe there might have been um, past traumas. Um, also just to make them um, relax. And also the influence of media has been um, definitely an issue. 
Also, the Drug Enforcement Administration reported that in 2011, 2.6 million uh, people ages 12 and older use tramadol for non-medical purposes. Um, so this can be an issue um, as there's been an increase of tramadol prescription over the past few years. And um, according to CDC, one in five teens abuse prescription medications and approximately 21% of seniors in high school ha has actually reported using marijuana in the past month. Um, and also according to National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, that was from that. And then um, again, just overall, all these issues really lead to the importance of being aware and um, providing safe drug use education in adolescents. So for me, this was kind of the, um, the target population um, that I worked with. Um, so the students were mainly coming from these area, the West region of Chicago, which includes the North and South Lawndale area, Humboldt Park, East and West Garfield Park. Um, so as you can see, the population in, in, in these areas is predominantly um, Hispanic and Black. So 48.1% being Hispanic or Latino and 46.1% Black or African American. And then for, this is just a quick, um, you know, comparison that I included for some stats. So, um, you know, as in this area, um, compared to just kind of Chicago as a whole, you can see that the annual income in this region is about 30K compared to the 57K um, for Chicago. And overall, um, the annual income is much less than the median annual income um, across the entire United States, which, which came out to be around like 61K. So you can see that, um, you know, people in this area, doesn't, they don't even make half the um, amount of average annual income um, nationwide. And also in terms of part, poverty level, um, you know, the most common racial and ethnic group below the poverty line um, in this area is um, black, followed, black followed by uh, Hispanic um, and white. And again, you know, this is an issue that um, can be a barrier to proper health access and quality of life. And so as a comparison, the national poverty level is an average of 13.1%. So this region has a much higher poverty level of 36.1%, which is, I mean, almost three times higher. Um, so the largest demographic in poverty has shown to be in the age groups um, here listed. So you can see it's kind of relatively young. Um, so for me, I think just kind of intervening and really targeting the youth um, made it even more important for this project. Um, and so in terms of the health disparities, um, you know, again, here, 23% within this populator, uh, population are uninsured, meaning that health issues and barriers um, to proper health care, um, you know, there's even more of that. And um, looking at it and compared to Chicago, it's, you know, two times more the average population. So overall, the student that I work with are under-resourced and providing health education to their learning would really enable positive lifestyle choices in their future. Um, so many of the students um, really lack access to learning environments and resources. So um, a lot of the reasons, you know, as mentioned, like due to systemic inequities and um, the effects of students um, coming from color and different minority groups. So for um, my project, oh, no, no. Okay, um, so for my project, um, you know, as, as stated, the misuse and abuse of drugs impact youth negatively, and there's a lack of knowledge about the safe drug use in, um, in the areas that um, are really under-resourced, and um, this can lead to risky attitudes and low perceptions of harm. So uh, through this education, students will be able to learn valuable information about drug and uh, risks that come with it, They'll also be provided with information that's accurate, accessible, and actionable. And ultimately, we want to really build a strong sense of um, healthcare and enable the students to have more of an active role in decisions. And um, also, lastly, I also included a uh, section where, um, you know, I was able to teach the students the role of a pharmacist and how they can access them and um, how they can really help as well in their lives. So. 
Here is just a, kind of a project description in summary. So again, the purpose of the urban pharmacy program here at UIC is really just to serve in the underserved communities. And, um, you know, throughout this course, I was really able to find value and learn um, how important it is that health literacy is so fundamental to healthcare, and it really allows individuals to access care and make informed decisions and help maintain healthy lifestyles. And so this is my timeline. Um, initially, um, you know, planning everything, sometimes it doesn't work out the way it planned, but this is a summary of kind of what I was able to establish throughout this um, course. And so from most of um, 2017, I was working on really developing that curriculum and, um, you know, making it more uh, solidified throughout that year. And then in um, January to September, so most of the 20, um, within 2018 was to find that partnership. So really selling, you know, um, my buy-in and um, trying to reach out to a lot of different programs to find partnership, um, which was actually personally a struggle, but I was able to actually partner up with someone. And so after I did that, um, I also further um, continued to like mold the different lesson plans so it fit particularly to, to their program, which I'll kind of go more into. Um, and then um, in 2019, uh, I was able to work with about 9 to 13 students per session, and um, I was educating them about the safe medication use through different lesson plans and activities and videos. Also, the students were tested on their knowledge before and after each of the lesson plan and activities to really see how much they really learned um, and to see if there was an impact in um, their knowledge. And then um, students also had the opportunity to fill out a survey um, on their overall learning experience after each lesson. And then, so this is the proposal letter that I created um, when I was reaching out to the different programs and um, different schools. And so here it just kind of summarizes the different, um, the, the buy-in, you know, um, just kind of the different uh, stats that are happening, how it's really dangerous uh, for students um, due to just the misuse in drugs, and then the content that's going to be shared, and then um, the different assessment, and then um, just kind of, um, you know, concluding with the contact information if they had any further questions. So I was able to kind of um, send this out to the different schools and uh, programs. And so finally, I was able to partner up with a program um, called City or Program. And um, their goal is to ensure that students have a relationship and resources to help the students thrive. And so this is actually a very big organization, um, but I was able to work within a um, specific uh, department within this program. Um, and further city year, um, the, they call them the core members, which are the volunteers in this program. And they actually tutor and they serve in schools all day, every day to help the students. And they really help the students in different aspects in their lives, whether it's social, social emotional, or academic skills. Um, and really ultimately just to um, help them have this mindset to succeed in school and in life. And so City Year actually uh, works alongside um, the Chicago Public School and District Partners, and they really try to share what they learn um, to the students, and they also ensure um, equitable access to learning opportunities for all students. So I just felt like this was the perfect, um, you know, partnership opportunity, and thankfully, um, Jackie, who I worked with in planning everything, um, was the City Year Impact Manager um, within this region. And so I worked really closely with her. And then um, for the method of this curriculum, <clears throat> so um, what happened for the lessons was we would meet on Saturdays in the mornings. And depending on the location was um, an assigned Chicago public school. So um, we mainly worked at Piccolo Elementary um, Public School, Chicago Public School. And so um, these were the different lesson plans, and I will go more in depth with them um, later on. But basically, the outline of each lesson plan was to provide them with a pre-quiz that was five minutes, and then introduce the subject, um, and then present the educational materials um, after that. So the PowerPoint slides, and then also different activities and methods to get them engaged. 
And then I would end up with a post quiz and then also give them a survey about their um, overall course experience. So total is about 40 minutes. And then at the end, I kind of like um, stayed around in class to provide, um, you know, any answers to any questions that they might have or even just get to know them. Um, so that was actually kind of my favorite part of each lesson. But um, definitely, I think that was essential also. Um, so here for lesson one, um, you know, just kind of summarizing, these are the different um, lessons that I was able to provide. So for one was to really see how drugs, drugs affect the body, um, you know, discussing the different factors that contribute to the physical dependence, um, different reduction, harm reduction concepts and strategies the students can take with them. And then for lesson two, I talked about um, going more in depth into the different drug classes talked about this prescription and specifically about opioids and learning about the effects and risks and benefits um, with both um, opioids and stimulants. And then um, just being able to really recognize the different signs and symptoms and um, for the signs of like possible opioid overdose and how to respond. And um, students also learned about the harm reduction concepts. And then lesson three, um, I included alcohol and other depressants because these were actually found to be um, like the highest used uh, substance uh, within um, teens and adolescents. So again here, you know, really learning about the facts of depressants um, and then also just kind of finding ways um, to reduce the harms by going through different practice scenarios. And then for lesson four, um, mental health and coping, I thought this was pretty important within adolescents, especially with all the peer pressure and the stress that they go through. So just kind of discussing how drugs can be used um, to deal with mental um, health issues if used properly and um, also just um, to locate different resources that can help them cope. Um, and then the last one was more of just a professional lesson, which was kind of a more casual um, lesson in talking about the role of a pharmacist um, and how pharmacists can help the community and then um, just discuss how pharmacists um, can be used as a resource for health. So these are just different supplemental materials I use. So here these were my lecture slides, um, so the different lessons and then here are just um, a little bit of the activities and videos that I incorporated into my curriculum. So different activities, um, like the students were able to play out different scenarios. I also played videos, you know, just to make sure that these kids are engaged. Um, so again, you know, throughout the uh, first half of 2019, I was able to conduct a total of 53 students. Um, throughout, you know, lesson one through five. And the survey was given to assess their experience um, uh, from each educational lesson. Um, and then a total of five was conducted. The first four were educational. And um, again, for those, a pre and a post quiz survey uh, and a survey portion was um, administered to the students. And then um, the last lesson was a professional lesson on the role of pharmacists. So here is just an example of, um, you know, this is from the first lesson that I gave out. It just five, it, um, it contains five questions and it's the same for the pre and the post. So really um, seeing their knowledge before and after. And then here is the class experience survey. So, um, you know, it's based off of this just like small, really quick survey to assess um, what their overall experience was. So this was the result of the pre and post quiz. So from um, you know lesson one through four, you can see that there was definitely increase in their knowledge after the lessons, um, as you can see here uh, visually. Um, also here, this is the results from the class experience. So it was based off of a Likert scale. So from strongly disagree to strongly agree, um, you know they would select their um, their answers in term, um, from these questions. So here is kind of per each lesson is divvied up into the three different questions. And so no one really strongly disagreed. Um, there was maybe an individual here and, here and there that disagreed um, with question one, which is learn something new today. 
Um, you know, there was a few individuals that felt neutral throughout, but you can see that majority of the individuals had a relatively um, positive experience. And so just to kind of summarize, um, both the pre and post quiz consisted of five questions per each lesson. And the average for the pre-quiz was 63%, and then afterwards was 90%. So you can see that there was definitely an increase um, after each lesson plan, plan um, by an average of 27%. And then overall, 83% of the students agreed or strongly agreed with having a positive experience across all four lessons. So, um, you know, this meant that the students were able to learn something new, that they actually felt encouraged to make healthy decisions, and that they also felt satisfied with the quality of teaching. Um, so, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take any pictures um, due to just CPS uh, regulations and rules. So, um, I mean, I guess this is kind of the best representation of what I look like uh, when I was teaching. Um, but, you know, overall, I think almost all the students were able to learn something new after every lesson. Um, and some things that I just kind of um, noted was that the um, individual that had disagreed in, the, in their positive experiment for two of the lessons um, was coming from the same individual. So um, I know it's minor, um, but just something to keep note of um, in case, you know, um, this would be more of like a statistical like, um, and more of like an analytical uh, project, but um, also uh, something to be aware of is that not every session was consistent with the same students from previous sessions, um, and the sample size for each lesson varied. Uh, also something that I was able to kind of um, think throughout this project was that, you know, there was definitely room for other lesson plans. Um, so the possibility of incorporating um, different lesson plans going along um, with this project. And then also uh, the curriculum-based studies are, can be a little bit challenging due to the variability in the learning materials and style from the students. So overall, just in conclusion, um, medication education by Student pharmacists um, impacted the students' knowledge in drug use, and the results that were retrieved from um, this study could be used as a tool to make further improvements um, for future lessons. And then also, it's really important to make sure to keep students engaged and active to um, maintain their focus. Um, and then also just really encouraging partnership with community service programs to help provide um, health education within adolescents. Um, and lastly, just really the outline of this project um, can be used for future curriculum based project. And so, um, yeah, overall, you know, this was just such a great experience for me, although the planning and everything was and the partnership finding partnership was much longer than the actual conducting of um, the project. I think um, in my personal growth um, and development, I learned a lot and um, it definitely uh, could be continued. And I hope that this presentation um, can bring forth, um, you know, new ideas and um, for the, you know, upcoming uh, urban pharmacy students. So oh, that ends my presentation. This, these are my references. Uh, what questions do you have? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danera, and I will be introducing you to our capstone study. Thank you for joining us and for this opportunity to share our capstone study with you. The title of our capstone project is Prevention and Overall Health diabetes and hypertension. This was a team effort and this presentation was prepared by Uli Osaki, Jasmine Sotelo, Devin Yates, Serge Inge, Folu Ogunaluri, Paul Majerkat, and John Aranu. At the end of our presentation, please feel free to ask questions. The relationship between low health literacy and low socioeconomic status has been linked to unfavorable health outcomes. According to a meta-analysis study, increase in the risk of hypertension was highest among minorities. Implementation of teachings and educational programs, incorporating pharmacologic treatment and lifestyle modifications 
can reduce the risk of mortality and improve overall health outcomes. Therefore, the purpose of our study was to determine if student pharmacist literacy information focusing on topics such as lifestyle modifications, so think diet and exercise, insight motivation, and show how diabetes and hypertension can be managed by recognizing signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia and hypertension, could decrease health disparities in an underserved community. So our study took place at the Metropolitan Apostolic um, Community Church, which is located in the Bronzeville neighborhood at 4100 South King Drive here in Chicago. And it was supervised by their lead pastor, Pastor Alan Conley. Um, he provided the space that we needed. And in addition to participating himself, he also encouraged uh, the entire congregation to, to do the same. And then in the course of our study, um, we observed that there were three prominent healthcare entities in that neighborhood. Um, that included the Marianos and Walgreens Pharmacy, both of which um, we determined did not have a blood uh, pressure monitoring curve. Also, they had a Mercy, they have Mercy Hospital, which is nearby. And our target population uh, was the, the church congregation, which is typically African-American, about uh, 97 to 98%. And it included adults um, at least 18 years of age and, ho and older who were willing to participate. With that, I'll hand over to Devin, who will talk about our study period and what it entailed. Hello, everyone. Um, once again, my name is Devin Yates. So at this point, I'll be talking about our, um, when we conducted our study. So the first part of our study was actually conducted from October to December of 2019. Um, and then the second part of our study was conducted from January to March of 2019. We held bi-weekly sessions, so we did, we went every other Sunday and we went into the church and conducted our um, surveys and pre-surveys, which I'll talk about next. Um, and then the services or the sessions usually started around 1130 um, and we'll go from 1.30 to 3.30 um, doing our surveys and blood pressure screenings. So what we wanted to do at the church was to introduce lifestyle modifications um, that are effective for our church members and hypertension. Uh, we wanted to motivate these um, constituents to be active and be healthy and be knowledgeable about their disease states. We want to show how hypertension and diabetes could be managing, managed by recognizing the signs and symptoms of both these conditions. Um, so with the, each visit, we gave the church members a pre-survey. Um, we also, after the pre-survey was done, we would give them a hypertension and diabetes um, lecture or personal um, education session with those, each, one, each one of those church members. And then we provide the materials with how they can better them, their lifestyle themselves outside of this, the setting that we were in. Um, once we conducted our um, individual or personalized um, education session. We would then give them a post-survey, which will include the same um, survey questions from the pre-survey in order to measure their response in, uh, from the education that we had just given them. Um, they would then use this post-survey in order to um, receive a screening. So we kind of use the surveys um, as a, we use a blood pressure screening, we use a blood pressure screening as a buy-in for them to um, complete the surveys. So once they would complete the survey, the post-survey, they would give the screen, the sc whoever was conducting the screening, um, the post-survey, and from there we would then um, do our screening for blood pressure. Um, after the screening, um, the conductor of the screening would then address any remaining health literacy issues that that patient or um, church member may have. So this is our first question on our pre and post survey. Um, we want to make sure that um, our patients understood not only what hypertension was, but how diet and exercise could play into it. So our first question here focused more on sort of the diet. And we wanted to ask them if having a lot of salt in their diet can cause their blood pressure to be high. This is the first thing we assessed. Um, 
on our first day, we had 19 out of 20 people who answered it true, which is great. They already knew. And then after um, we did our education, everybody got it right. On day two, that number went from, um, we only had 10 participants where nine got it correctly. And then afterwards, all 10 did. And our final day, day three, um, there were 15 participants in total. 14 got that first question correct. And then after we did our education again, all 15 answered it correctly. That salt can increase salt pressure. Um, so moving on to our second question. Um, this one was a circle that all apply, so it's a little bit more difficult, but we wanted to make sure they had a um, full understanding about hypertension and how all the different either comorbidities or diet or exercise can play into uh, their blood pressure. So uh, for this one to kind of stratify the results, we had to be a little creative. So what we did was, um, since as you can see, there are five possible answers to get correctly. They should have uh, circled all of them. We had given it a point system. Um, so it's this question is where we actually saw our greatest improvement after education was given. So if they got all five correctly, um, they were given five points. So we calculated this and put it in terms of a percentage. And initially, when over all three days, we stratified this over all three days, we saw that only 81.8% of patients have gotten it correctly. And then after we did our education, we saw that number go up to 95%. So that's a difference of 13.2 that we witnessed with our patients, where after giving our education, their understanding increased greatly. Uh, so moving on to our next question. So again, um, this we wanted to make sure patients understood that how having high blood pressure can cause other issues to occur. Um, so it doesn't just impact having blood pressure because patients will often say, well, I don't feel that it's high, so I'm not worried about it. But we wanted them to understand that this can lead to having other issues and complications in their life. So which is why we put this question in there. Um, so again, on day one, we had 20 participants, um, only 18 knew this, and after education, that increased to everybody understanding. Um, on day two, it was nine out of 10 patients, and then that increased to everybody again, seven out of 10. And day three, it went from 14 patients getting it correctly to the full 15. All right, so moving on to the last two questions that we had on the survey. The purpose of these questions were to assess participants' knowledge of a healthy blood pressure range and also to gauge how often they exercise in a week. So for question four, overall, although not great, there was a slight increase in the number of people that answered the question correctly in the post-survey as shown on the slide. On day one, we saw an increase of four, 21 people answered the question correctly on the post survey compared to 17 in the pre-survey questions. On day two, 10 people answered correctly in the post, in the post survey compared to nine in the pre-survey period. And lastly, as we can see on day three, 13 people answered correctly in the per survey versus 12 as shown in the pre-survey. Again, the purpose of this particular question, question five, was to get a better understanding of participants' physical activities. And for the results, we saw a variation among the participants. Some participants said that they exercised at least one to two times a week, while others said that they exercised uh, more to five times a week. So in conclusion, low literacy can affect patients' well-being, but with education and promotion of a healthy lifestyle, patients can improve their health outcome as well as their quality of life. The educational sessions led by us, student pharmacists, provided substantial improvements in understanding of hypertension and key factors for preventing and managing hypertension. The results from this study supports that findings, supports that educational programs created and led by student pharmacists are effective in improving health literacy in minority and underserved population. So therefore, future implementations of educational programs in underserved communities are warranted, especially with pharmacy students. In terms of limitations, 46 
people participated in the survey. And so with this small sample size, we saw that this limited the ability to detect a meaningful difference in improvements of health literacy education among the participants. Additionally, participation and educational sessions occurred during lunch hours right after service, which was sometimes difficult because the majority of the participants were focused on eating. And so as a result, we saw a decrease in participation and focus among the group as a whole. Lastly, we had a low retention rate, likely due to the fact that we did not have the same people show up on all three days. We had different people show up on different days. Some participants completed all questions and some didn't and just stopped halfway. And so the poor patient retention, so poor participants retention rate that we saw led to the inability to see growth in health outcomes or continued health literacy education retention. And so with that, I'll go over and pass it on to Devin. Hello. So um, our preceptors for this uh, project included Dr. Christina Godwin, um, PharmD, and Dr. Jewel Young. Um, these two wonderful pharmacists were able to come in and help us um, conduct our blood pressure screening, which was necessary that we did need a, a professional pharmacist there with us in order to conduct the screenings. Um, amongst giving us advice as far as, um, you know, when we first got to the project, we had some issues with um, trying to get people to come up to us and talk to us. And one of the things that our preceptors helped us out with was finding different ways um, in order to, um, you know, go, go to the population and get the population to come to us and give them the education that we needed to, to give them. Um, so that included um, things such as white coat syndrome. So from our first visit, um, we had our white coats on. The second visit we came in, we took our, sorry, we took off our white coats and we were able to get a much better response. Um, also, just having a more efficient um, function such as the pre-survey and the post-survey and then going into the blood pressure screening. Um, once again, um, I can't thank these two preceptors enough for all that, they, all that they've done. And here is a, a picture of us at our site. As you can see, this is kind of a, a closer look at the setup that we have for the blood pressure screening. We have multiple blood pressure screen, uh, blood pressure cuffs there, um, as various sizes. That way we can ensure that we captured all of the church members um, of various shapes and sizes and um, just make sure that we're able to afford each church member um, the best um, reading that we could uh, give to them. So this year, um, or this past year, we had the opportunity to go to the ASHP 2019 Mid-Year Conference, and we were able to actually um, give uh, a look at our project um, to our fellow pharmacy students and pharmacists. Um, this was a wonderful opportunity for us all. Um, we were able to learn and grow from it, as well as um, present some of the hard work that we've done over the past four years in the Urban Pharmacy Program. Um, and also just like to thank Dr. Awe and the Urban Pharmacy Program for the, um, for, the, for the help that they were able to contribute to us as well and just giving us a platform in order to get this project off the ground and present it to our neighborhood in Bronzeville. And here's a up close view of our poster that we had during mid-year. Um, we were able to compile, we were able to compile um, the data that we extracted from our project, our capstone project, and um, compile it all into this poster. Um, we got a lot of compliments on the poster, um, especially because of the material of the poster, um, which I'm sure you all will see at UIC. Um, once again, just a wonderful experience. Um, if anyone is on the call and has not went to mid-year yet, I would definitely recommend it. And here's our acknowledgement section. Um, as far as the acknowledgements, we just like to thank Dr. Or pastor Alan Connolly. Um, he was the pastor at the church. Um, also again, Dr. Jewel Young and Dr. Christina Godwin. Um, we also like to thank Dr. Awe, once again, for giving us the platform that we needed in order to conduct this project. 
Um, and we also would like to thank our fellow um, U Farm classmate, Tamara Polis, because she was also very instrumental in this um, project as well and was able to assist us with our blood pressure screenings as well as our health literacy education sessions. And with that, we will conclude our um, presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Hey guys, it's Travis. Um, great job on your um, project, your poster and presentation as well. Got to work with that. Um, I wanted to know, so it looks like throughout the study, it seemed like the more education you gave patients, the more empowered they seemed to be and the more understanding, or the more understanding they had about their health. I'm wondering if you think that would extrapolate to their medications as well. Um, so if you, for instance, explain to them like how an ACE inhibitor, not necessarily going to the mechanism of action, but just explaining how that actually lowered their blood, blood pressure, do you think that would, um, do anything to adjust their adherence. So yes, um, one of the things that we um, noticed was that the the church members were very receptive to the education that we were giving them. Um, so we were able to see some correlation between the education and then the retention and um, improving that literacy. Um, so that's one of the next steps that we would like to see um, from our project is to bring that in, bring that medication aspect into it, um, forming a type of some type of a MTM clinic or um, MTM education service. Um, we did encourage some patients to bring in their medications just in case they did have any questions about them, um, but we didn't really focus too much on. Um, extrapolating that data from them or as far as like if they were receiving the education that we were giving them from the medication aspect it was more from the um, lifestyle modification and exercise aspect and just understanding the overall disease aspect that we wanted to focus on um, through the initial phase of this project thank you Any other questions for us? That concludes our presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Victoria. Growing up in the southwest side of Chicago, um, I was aware of the segregation within the city. So then as I grew older, I became more aware of the health inequalities that each neighborhood kind of faced and the differences in the quality of healthcare people receive. So I chose to be in the U Farm program because I wanted to do my part as a pharmacist to kind of help improve health literacy um, and help improve these inequalities in healthcare. Hello, my name is Paul, and uh, I was lucky to come from a community that didn't really struggle too much with health education as well as getting access to health care. So although I was from the suburbs of Chicago, I was kind of blind to the health disparities that many communities were facing, probably in the west and south areas of Chicago. So uh, with the help of UFARM, I was able to learn more about those disparities and how can I help tackle those disparities as a future pharmacist. And overall, um, this is a very rewarding experience for me being part of U Farm and helped shape um, kind of the career path that I had uh, as a pharmacist. So this is our capstone presentation, Diabetes Support in Humboldt Park. Okay, 
So a little introduction about our presentation. Uh, the goal of our capstone project was to provide education and improve health literacy to a community with health disparities. Humboldt Park has a large Hispanic population with an increased prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, and other health issues due to factors such as socioeconomic status. Here is an outline of what our presentation will go over. So we'll start with our demographics, then we'll move to the buy-in, our site, our purpose, go over our curriculum, the assessment we use, the results, and then a discussion of the results and some hurdles we face along with our conclusion. Now let's move into the demographics. These are some Humble Park demographics taken from the current census data. So the median household income is $32,562. This is about half the median income of Illinois and about half the median income of the United States. And the percentage of people in Humboldt Park who are below poverty line is 30.3%. Um, this is more than double the state and national rate. And then here you can see the household income broken down in percentage. So 67% of the population make under 50K, 23% make between 50 to 100K, and 9% make between 100 and 200K. And again, this is the whole household income, so it's not just like one primary person. And in this neighborhood, there tends to be maybe one or two generations of families living in with, within one house. So this can be several people's income com combined. Now moving on to some education demographics. So 65.8% of the population have a high school graduate degree or higher. And as you can see here, the population breakdown. So 34% have no degree, 29% have a high school degree, 25% have some college, and 9% have a bachelor's, and 3% have postgraduate training. This is low in comparison to state and national average. So about 88% within the state and the national average have a high school graduate degree or higher. So it's over 20% below the average. Now, we chose to work in Humboldt Park due to their low socioeconomic status, their lower than average education levels, and also due to the fact that they are a food and pharmacy desert. Humboldt Park's community has insufficient access to fresh fruits, vegetables, and other whole foods due to restricted access to quality supermarkets. There's only one grocery store chain in the entire neighborhood. Um, you can see like Aldi right there, and this is on the far east side of the neighborhood. And many people have trouble getting around due to disabilities or transportation issues or not having a car. So many people end up walking to the stores and it may be very difficult to get to this one Aldi. So many of the patients and people in the population tend to use the corner stores. And as you can see, there are many corner stores in Humboldt Park. However, these really lack the healthy options that the community needs. Also, major pharmacy chains such as CVS and Walgreens are not located within the Humboldt Park neighborhood. They're like right outside the neighborhood. So again, they're missing healthy grocery stores and pharmacy chains. As for some overall health demographics, about 49.8% 49 of adults have one or more chronic disease in the US. Seven of 10 deaths are caused by chronic disease. And 63.4% of diabetes patients have some mobility limitation. Now, to narrow into our, the health demographics of our neighborhood, according to the Chicago Health Atlas, the chronic diseases that cause the highest morbidity in Humboldt Park are obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. Some major contributing factors to this are the food accessibility, which we just talked about, and then also socioeconomic status. Um, as for our buy-in, the efforts of the UFARM group started back in the class of 2018, who started to establish a pharmacy presence in the clinic. Our buy-in was through Eva Hernandez, who worked as a nurse at the clinic. And then we've continued this involvement throughout the following UFARM classes. The purpose was to improve health literacy in an underserved population and become a presence in the community that the patients can trust and come to for assistance. As for our site, um, this is the clinic. So this is the Miles Square Health Center of Humboldt Park. It's a clinical practice of the University of Illinois in Chicago um, by the College of Nursing. So it's an academic nursing managed health center that provides comprehensive community-based healthcare with UI Health. So the center is located in the West Humboldt Park area, so all the way on the west side of the neighborhood. 
and they really lack a primary care physician presence in this area. I tried looking up how many primary cares are in the area, and I found one. And when I tried looking into his uh, website and his practice, it turns out he's actually shut down his practice. So this is one of the only centers that provides care to these patients in this area. So it's very important to these people. Again, the group was led by Ms. Eva Hernandez. Uh, we had several mediators, so we con consisted of four pharmacy students, two nursing students, and a counselor. Also, we had some guest appearances made by a podiatrist, a dentist, and a Zumba instructor. Now, this is our group. Um, here are some photos of us working with the members of the group. We had a small group. It averaged about six to 12 members, depending on the week and the attendance. This allowed for an intimate setting and a lot of one-on-one -on -one with the patients. The patients had uh, varying levels of education, so this helped us to uh, kind of like bring things down and work on their level to ensure that everyone understood exactly what we were talking about and trying to teach them about diabetes. And most have very low, um, very poor health literacy. So again, uh, we got creative with the way we were teaching so that we can help everybody out. Some suffered from uh, emotional issues related to diabetes, so a lot of them actually had depression and anxiety related to their health state. Uh, this was something kind of new to us that we didn't really see in a regular pharmacy setting. So now I'm gonna go more into our actual curriculum. So our diabetes support group uh, consisted over seven weeks where we'd meet once a week for an hour and a half to two hours to um, go over different topics with the members. Um, so for the first uh, week, the first day, we had a meet and greet with the members where they introduced themselves um, uh, to us as well as we all introduced ourselves to the group. So there were some veterans in the group that had been with the diabetes support group for um, a while now and as well as new members. So we had the members formulate um, a couple posters uh, to write down all the things that they wanna learn about for the next seven weeks. So on these posters, there are things like medications and their side effects, something that us as pharmacy students could really focus on. And then we had other things like dental care and uh, foot care and depression. And all these things were things that we plan on going over for the next seven weeks to make sure we hit on all the questions that these members would have. So um, after week one, we met the second week to get started on exercise. So we discussed uh, what are the benefits of exercise in patients that have diabetes. So um, a big thing is with this group was the limited mobility. So we wanted to allow the members to still partake in exercise as it's great for their health and get their heart rate up, even if they're not able to be very mobile. So we came up with uh, chair exercises. So something the members can do while they're sitting in their living room or watching TV. They can be moving their legs, just moving their bodies to help get their heart rates up. And another thing is we don't want to overwork the patients. So a lot of them suffer from disease states such as asthma or COPD. So they have, um, they may become short of breath very easily. So we did go over the inhaler use. We had each member bring in their inhalers. We also had some demonstration inhalers, which we went over with um, the members just to make sure they're having proper technique. Lastly, um, patients with diabetes often also have hypertension. So we did go over um, the patient's blood pressure as well. Uh, what are goals for their blood pressures and why it's important to exercise, not just only for their diabetes, but also for their blood pressures. And then in week three, we had uh, two outside instructors come in. We had both a Zumba instructor as well as a podiatrist. So once the members finished with their Zumba session, we discussed what is proper hydration. So there's a lot of drinks out there that the patients might think are healthy for them, such as juices that have really high amounts of sugar. So although they may have the vitamins that the patients want, it also they have to be looking out to make sure they're not consuming way too much sugar. So we had a poster board that had uh, the nutrition facts of lots of different drinks, such as Gatorade, um, juices, sugar-free Gatorade, and different uh, sports drinks. And we really talked about which ones are best for the members to be drinking. And uh, then we had the podiatrist go into foot care. Since patients with diabetes have a higher prevalence of um, things like foot ulcers, as well as peripheral neuropathy, and can even lead to getting their feet amputated. So the podiatrist discussed 
how it's important to check and clean the feet every day, making sure there's no ulcers or lacerations on their feet to help prevent infection. Uh, they talked about proper um, foot and shoe care, making sure they're checking their shoes and making to sure, make sure there's no um, rocks or anything else in there that could cause a laceration. Um, and overall, just good um, foot care. Uh, we also answered any questions the patients could have had about fungal infections or other infections that, um, of their feet. In week four, we had a dentist come in. Um, patients with diabetes have an increased risk of tooth decay, gingivitis, periodontitis. So uh, the dentist went over how to properly um, brush the teeth, how often they should be brushing their teeth, uh, when they should look for um, professional help. Let's say they're experiencing pain or they might think they have an infection and um, just answer general questions of proper dental hygiene. In week five, we went in depth on healthy eating and as well as nutrition labels. So a lot of these members had some experience with nutrition labels. They might've heard it from their um, healthcare providers in the past, but we went more in depth and wanted to make sure the patients understand um, that although something might have four grams of carbohydrates, they have to be looking at the serving size. Um, for example, something with three servings, they might be having 12 grams instead of four grams. So we went in depth of what they should be looking out for. Um, what's it, Another thing that's important is the sodium con uh, content of what they're eating. Since a lot of them do have hypertension, we wanna make sure they're also monitoring how much sodium they have in their diets. And that led us to talk about fresh versus frozen, frozen versus canned vegetables. Um, in this community, it's a lot more difficult for them to obtain fresh vegetables. So a lot of them are eating canned vegetables, which, are, which have much higher concentration of salts. Um, so we gave them information about nearby farmers markets to help them try and access the fresh vegetables to help them get the best nutritional value. Um, lastly, we also talked about how um, sugar carbohydrates play a role on their blood sugar. And for a few patients, we went into how um, diet can affect their INR since they are on warfarin. In week six, we went more into how um, mood and depression can be intertwined with diabetes. So these patients, um, the members of the group experience a lot more stress and anxiety. Uh, they have a very difficult regimen to maintain. They might have to be taking a lot of medications. They may be having to check their blood sugar several times a day. So with all this um, extra steps that they have to be taking, they can feel overwhelmed. So we talked about how important it is to have support, such as this support group where these members can see that they're not alone in diabetes, that there's other people that are dealing with these same conditions and that um, we wanted to provide any help and support that we could. So we also gave um, resources about other outside uh, support groups that could further help if they're feeling depressed. And then as pharmacy students, we also talked about the importance of um, medication adherence for antidepressants. So we want to make sure the patients aren't just taking the antidepressants when they're feeling down, that um, we educated them that they really need to be adherent to their medication, take them as directed by their uh, physician to have the best effect. And finally, we got to week seven, which was our week as the pharmacy students. We led the whole um, education lesson this time. We started with a pre-quiz and we would finish up with a post-quiz at the end of it. So throughout this day, we would answer any questions the members could have had about their medications, any side effects, or how they should be taking their medications. Uh, another big thing is we stress the importance of blood glucose testing. Uh, the meters, the patients brought in their blood glucose meters and we had some of our own as well to demonstrate how to properly be taking their blood sugar, also the importance of taking it um, in the morning as a fasting blood glucose, as well as after meals. One thing that we did notice um, is that one of the members of the group actually had an app on his phone that he thought was checking his blood sugar. So he was showing other members how easy it is to check his blood sugar. He'd press um, his phone and he'd get a reading. So this was a good time for us as pharmacy students um, just to show proper education that that's not gonna work. And that could have actually led to very poor outcomes because if the patient was experiencing low blood sugar but clicked on his phone app and it said he had high blood sugar, um, he could have really suffered from the hypoglycemia. So another thing we talked about was over-the-counter medications as well as herbals. This uh, community was very interested in herbal supplements and we just wanted to let them know that there could be potential drug interactions with these supplements and that they should always have their healthcare providers be aware of what herbals they're taking to keep those herbals on their medication list as well. 
And lastly, we uh, and here's our assessment. You can go ahead to the next slide. So we had our post uh, quiz afterwards and it was a multiple choice format. I had questions on there such as, what is the most common uh, side effect experienced with metformin? What should you do if you experience that side effect? Um, what is your normal fasting blood glucose? Uh, what's your goal A1C? And what should you do if you experience hypoglycemia? And here is the results from our assessment. So um, in the gray, we have the pre-assessment um, questions correct. And in the blue, it's the questions that were uh, correct after our education session. So for all questions, there was improvement in the uh, amount of correct questions. And just more discussion of the results is that all the uh, members had some baseline understanding of diabetes. Um, but we did see that after our information session that all of them did improve on um, their scores. Uh, a downside was that we only had six of our 12 group members that were present on the day of our assessment. So unfortunately, we would, in the future, we'd want to have more um, patients present to see how much um, we're actually helping them. But we did have an overall increase of 26% before the education to 73% total score after the presentation. So there was still improvement for all questions. Some hurdles we faced throughout our um, group sessions were illiteracy. So we had some patients who could not read or write. In order to like kind of help them and teach them, we would have someone, one of our moderators, whether a pharmacy student or one of the nursing students, kind of work one-on-one -on -one with the illiterate patients to make sure that they were understanding the handouts, the quizzes, and anything that we were presenting to them. So that was one hurdle we faced. Some other hurdles were that patients came in with some prior beliefs about their medications, um, a lot of it from the internet, that is our third hurdle. So they came in thinking these things like certain medications are bad um, or they have certain ideas about things. So it was really hard to like get them to listen to us, but the way we got over that was just listening to them and understanding their side and what they are thinking and then kind of explaining to them our thought process and like how their medications will help them and telling them like the end result. So I think it was really beneficial to like sit down and like educate them one-on-one -on -one and answer these questions that no one's ever answered for them before. And then the last hurdle again is the food accessibility. So Paul talked about the farmer's markets that we showed them about. We also were able to find ones that accepted WIC and food stamps. So they were able to get these uh, healthier options at a discounted price. Um, as for some conclusions, West Humboldt Park is an area that greatly suffers from health inequalities and health literacy issues. As pharmacy students, we learned how to effectively translate medical terminology into patient-friendly verbiage to educate the patients uh, at their level. By learning how to communicate more effectively to our patients, we were able to improve their confidence and their ability to take their medications properly and their knowledge of diabetes. Pharmacy students can be beneficial in the West Humboldt Park neighborhood as health educators. Due to the easy accessibility of pharmacists, we play a vital role in the education of patients and the improvement of health literacy. We had a great time working with these patients. We really did end up building that relationship that we set out to build. They were very happy every time we came in. Um, we had a lot of regulars who were excited to see us. Um, we even handed out like gifts. So like on hydration day, we gave out water bottles that were donated. On pharmacy day, we gave out pill boxes. So the group was like really into our presentations and excited to come. So that is exactly what we set out to do. Hopefully pharmacy students in the future can continue to work in the West Humboldt Park neighborhood and close some of the health gaps that this population faces. These are our references and that concludes our presentation. Do you guys have any questions? Nope. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.